supported by Lloyd's Banking Group. My name is Carol Lewis. I'm Deputy Editor for Property at The Times and Sunday Times. I'm going to give a short introduction and then ask each of our panel to give some opening remarks before we begin the debate. But we do need you to join in. We need you to submit your questions on the YouTube live chat or by tweeting at CPS Think Tank. That's at CPS Think Tank. So please do start submitting those questions as soon as possible. So we're technically in the midst of one of the worst recessions in a century. The economy shrank by 20% in the three months to June, and yet the property market seemingly is riding high. Transactions are up and property prices are at a four year high. So we're in the midst of a mini property boom. It's riding on pent up demand, not just from the seven weeks when the market was closed during lockdown, but it dates back to the EU referendum back in June 2016 when uncertainty about Brexit and fear of a Corbyn-led um, Labour government stymied the market. Then, following the general election in December, the Conservative win brought some stability and we saw the market wake up and we had what's coined the Boris bounce in January and February. This was caught, cut dramatically short in March when the market was suspended because of COVID and when we saw it reopen in May 13th, we did see the transaction start to come through again. Then on July the 8th, the Chancellor put a rocket under the market when he announced a stamp duty cut. He raised the threshold for the tax from 125,000 to 500,000 in England and Northern Ireland, saving buyers up to 15,000 pounds per property. Wales and Scotland introduced their own measures. And now we've got everyone who thought about buying in the last couple of years, or who's been driven by uh, lockdown induced lifestyle changes, divorce, marriage, desire for a garden, and all those who thought they might buy in the coming year, all concentrated into the market now. But is it enough? Is it enough to save the economy? The, the storm clouds are gathering. Uh, the government's furlough scheme ends in October, and some of those 9.6 million people are likely to lose their jobs. We've got, I think, upwards of, of 2 million people who are on mortgage payment holidays. Those will start winding up in the autumn too. They could struggle to pay their mortgages. Um, should we be worried? Uh, and what's going to happen in March when the stamp duty holiday ends and when help to buy in its current guise winds up? I've got five wonderful panellists here who are going to help us unpick some of those issues. I'm going to ask them each in turn to give us a little introduction. We're going to start with Bob Seeley, MP for the Isle of Wight, who has said that one of his key aims is to increase the amount of affordable housing on the island, particularly for young people. Bob. Thanks, um, Carol. I'll just, I'll just shoot out a few ideas just to start off the discussion. Um, declining uh, an, econo uh, an economy in trouble is no excuse for bad policy making, so actually we have to get the policies right. That's the first point. Secondly, uh, economic growth is important, but actually the, ro the wrong housing in the wrong areas can actually damage economic growth. And I'm very happy to give you examples if we need from the Isle of Wight, and I'm sure other areas as well. One of the long-term problems we're facing, we have faced since World War II, and certainly from the 1960s, is that we have a declining city populations. And we haven't focused on growing cities, but we've instead focused on growing suburbs and developing shires. And actually, I think that's coming at an increasing price. The last election, we all voted, I certainly did, uh, but a lot of people in the Red Wall areas voted for a levelling up agenda. And what the, the new standard methodology, method for housing and the white paper rather depressingly seem to be reinforcing is not a leveling up, but a concreting out of the shires and the suburbs. Um, and I think we, are, we have a, a significant infrastructure project crawling out of London towards Birmingham, where I'm sure it will run out of money. It's called HS2, um, a very foolish decision in my opinion. Uh, and we've got the concreting out of these significant plans for increasing a house building in the shires and suburban areas. And I don't think this is necessarily the way forward economically, and I think it will come at significant impact uh, for a conservative support in those areas as well. And I think we need a leveling up agenda, not a concreting out agenda for the South. So uh, I want to see that leveling up agenda, and I'm not sure I'm seeing it from government policy at the moment. Thank you, thank you, Bob. So we go next to Mike Jones, who is Managing Director, Intermediaries and Specialist Brands Retail Banking at Lloyd's. Mike. Uh, Carol, thank you very much. Uh, long job title, I guess essentially that involves working with mortgage brokers and IFAs, an essential part of the mortgage distribution chain. I also chair Lloyd's internal housing forum, 
bringing together many of our key people who interact with different parts of the market. So that's mortgages, home insurance, lending to the social housing sector, the house builders, and including the housing growth partnership, JV, with the Ministry for Housing. Now, many of our conference guests will be familiar with Lloyds, I'm sure, but for the avoidance of doubt, this incorporates a number of very well-known brands, not least Lloyds Bank, Halifax, Bank of Scotland, Scottish Widows. We're overwhelmingly UK-focused financial services provider, and relevant today, we are the largest UK mortgage lender with a share of about a fifth of the UK market. We were particularly interested in first-time buyers, a part of the market where we focus our efforts to help for many years, responsible for about a quarter of the first-time buyer mortgages we participate in many of the government initiatives, including help to buy, shared ownership, and so on. We're also very strong in new build. And turning to today's topic, we're pleased to support this event, focusing on the role that housing can play. Now, housing and the broader construction sector will clearly have a very important role to play in supporting the economy through the tough times ahead. And in that context, it's vital that the pre-pandemic momentum on increasing housing supply is not lost. In the longer term, we see housing as part of the solution to tackle the UK's productivity puzzle. A more flexible liquid market can serve as a vehicle for mobility across the country, helping people, families to move up to meet the demands of skills in different regions, and in the process, of course, contributing to Bob's levelling up agenda. Now, a cursory glance at the current state of the market will lead you to believe that it's pretty benign. Transaction volumes, prices, all buoyant at present. But this is about pent-up demand in particular, and of course, the stamp duties help. Our own Halifax house price index, for instance, has noticed a rise of 1.6% in house prices across the UK on average between July and August, and over 5% up on the same month last year. And we see very high demand for new loans currently, and that's the case across the market. Scratch beneath the surface, and you'll be forgiven for questioning whether this activity will prove resilient in the wider economy longer term. And a particular note is the fact that home ownership has declined over the past decade compared to other forms of tenure. A concerning byproduct of this recent rise of prices, of course, is that the affordability of homes for people who set their hearts on that first step on the housing ladder. This is why we've turned our attention to the future of the government scheme to help to buy equity loan, which, despite its critics, has played a vital role in helping first-time buyers and supporting the construction of new homes. As the NAO found in this study last year, 38% of all new build property sales have been supported by the Help to Buy Equity Loan, with about four-fifths for first-time buyers and about a fifth for second and subsequent buyers. The Ministry for Housing's second evaluation of the scheme, published in 2018, also concluded that it had indeed increased housing supply by about 14%. So this is why we're supportive of the next but more targeted phase of the Help to Buy scheme coming in April next year, focusing exclusively on first-time buyers. It's also why we think there's merit in revisiting another part of the Help to Buy scheme that was wound down in 2016, namely the Help to Buy Mortgage Guarantee, which would help support lending at higher loan-to-values, um, up to 95%, and that critically also works in the second-hand market. We see this new version of Help to Buy as one of a number of tools at the disposal of the government to help saving for a deposit, alongside other schemes such as the recently announced First Homes, and the existing shared ownership programs, as well as reform to the long-term savings landscape that could, for example, allow the use of lifetime savings, perhaps pensions, to fund or support deposits on the first home too. Now, clearly the effective shutdown of the housing market has had an effect on the capacity of the sector already to build. To turn our attention to the economic recovery and to meet this renewed demand, it's important that we build on progress in recent years in housing supply. We published a commission on housing report in 2015 concluding that how the government's house building targets can be met through increased focus on diversity of supply. Now that doesn't just require the current large house builders, but also SME house builders, public authorities and housing associations all too. And we've put that recommendation to practice through the housing group partnership, our JV with Homes England, supporting the number of homes produced by small house builders. And we're looking to fund the increased capacity of modern methods of construction to help efficiency and competitiveness. Very important to supporting others into the market too. I'll stop there, plenty to discuss. I look Thank forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Liam Halligan next. He's a columnist for the Daily Telegraph and wrote the book Home Truths about the UK's um, housing shortage. Liam. Thanks, Carol. Well, I agree um, with what the government's done recently to some extent. Our tortuous case by case planning system does need reform. I've got a lot of respect for what my fellow panelist Nick Boy Smith has written about our planning system. So I do think we need more zoning in some areas. We need more clear and predictable building rules. And that is to some extent what the white paper proposes. But the fundamental problem I think the government has missed or deliberately missed. Um, it, the problem isn't what the government says in its uh, new proposals, quotes, a lack of land with planning permissions. For around 80% of permissions that are applied for 
are now being granted and that's been the case for some time. The real issue is the ever lengthening delay between permissions being granted and houses actually being built to address our chronic housing shortage. The galling truth is that the big powerful developers who hoover up most of the new planning permissions have long staged a deliberate go slow, making higher profits overall by producing fewer homes, so prices keep rising. And unless ministers acknowledge and tackle that massive market failure, our chronic housing shortage will remain with all the social, political and economic fallout that entails. If we really want to get the economy moving, we have to build more houses. Between 2010 and 2015, as I show in my book, an earlier planning shakeup saw the number of permissions granted each year increase by 75% on average. But the number of homes completed annually rose just 33%. Similarly, between 2015 and 2017, as permissions granted per annum increased by 36%, homes built rose just 15%. So the growing delay in build-out rates is significant and completely undeniable. Now, back in 20, 2008, countless SMEs would convert, they convert permissions into, into actual houses very quickly to aid their cash flow. Those SMEs in 2008 built over two thirds of all new homes. They now build under two fifths. Um, uh, and that's why the house building industry is so concentrated. Our top 10 house builders account for over 70% of all homes built now. Uh, and those who back capitalism rather than crony capitalism should be calling as I have been for some years for a full competition and markets authority inquiry into our house building sector. There's a lot more to say, but I'll just end my opening remarks with a quote from the very last interview that Robert Sc Roger Scruton ever gave. Solving our housing problem requires confrontation with vested interests, Professor Scruton said. And an awful lot of those vested interests, it has to be said, are connected to the Conservative Party. Well, hard, hard hitting stuff there from Liam. Next, I'd like to introduce Nicholas Boyce Smith, who is the founding director of Create Streets, which is a built environment research institute. Nicholas. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to my fellow panelists. I agree with almost everything, perhaps everything that Liam just said. Um, you know, uh, 25 years ago, the most common uh, name for new babies was, was Thomas and Rebecca. So Thomas and Rebecca are now 25. And I would like to ask, um, you know, what are their chances of owning their own home? Because the, the, the cruel fact is, as I suspect most of you know, is that their chances of owning their own home and their uh, disposable income, were they to be renting or even buying a place, has massively decreased generationally. So this is really the first time this has happened for over 100 years, other than little blips around world wars. So we've got a, and that's not just an existential crisis to the Conservative Party, though I think it is. I think it's an existential crisis you know, to our society um, and to how we function. So this is, I think, COVID notwithstanding, this is one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenge that our economy and our society faces, point one. Um, point two would be, um, you know, lots of the smoking guns that bits of the policy process uh, rise up as to blame for this are irrelevant. And don't let anyone fool you that things like empty homes are relevant. We've got the lowest number of empty homes in Europe. Um, all the credit rates, uh, we've got higher credit rates than uh, most of Europe, and that's not, uh, that's not the issue in stopping house building, uh, or um, small portions of affordable housing. That Some of the housing that should be built should definitely be affordable, but actually we've got well above the average uh, across Europe. So there are lots of smoking guns. Um, I think Liam's focus on the small proportion of homes built by uh, SMEs is absolutely crucial. I'd add to that uh, actually the difficulty of market entrance and market innovation. One of the reasons that we've, I, I don't think I can quite prove this, but we've certainly got one of the slowest take-ups of modern methods of construction in Europe. One of the reasons for that uh, is that the nature of planning risk in this country is so existentially high compared to most other countries. And this really gets to the heart of it. So um, I, I would agree with Liam's focus on SMEs, but I, I think it's not just, uh, I mean, I think the crony capitalism, which I agree with, is a function of the nature of risk largely, not entirely. Um, for the cruel fact is this, is we've always regulated the built environment you know those on the left who praise Ackley and those on the right who condemn him for you know for creating planning are both wrong 
um, you know, literally since the earliest cities, there is clear evidence of, you know, state control and inf in interference, if you like, on how we build. It's, it is literally as old as, as you know, man has lived in, uh, in, in, in towns and cities. Um, what's happened in this country is we've ended up with a very unpredictable system where it claims to be plan led, but actually it isn't. And, and, and planners make discretionary decisions uh, based, I mean, one, one developer said to me, the worst thing that can happen during a development process, process is that the planning control officer changes. Now that's a, a development control officer. That is an outrageous statement. Um, actually, I'm not making any accusation of corruption, but you know, that means who you know is more important than what you know. And it is no surprise that we, we have the systemically the smallest proportion of homes built by SMEs and the lowest amount of market entrance. And that's why the big, the big developers, the big house builders can build out so slowly. Um, so how do we get back to a system where a far higher proportion is built by SMEs, by self builders, by custom builders, by market entrants, by market innovators, as is happening in much of the rest of the world, from a political economies as different as Germany, France, Denmark, the States, we, we need to properly regulate as opposed to randomly uh, make things up on the fly. Um, we need to move the democracy forward, have shorter, more visual local plans that are clearer about where development goes. There's a separate and important issue that Bob touched on about where it is. And I think there's a separate discussion about leveling up and cities versus suburbs, which I'll, I'll park for now, but I'm sure we'll come back to, um, though it's a very, very important one. Um, but so clearer, more visual plans about where development is uh, go and then link to what local people like and what it should look like and how dense it should be. And what, if you create that regulatory certainty, then a whole range of people, including small house owners, can start to develop and build the homes that we need. And by the way, this isn't new. This is how we used to do it, and it is how much of the world does it. If you go back and read, and I'm afraid for my sins I have, you know, if you read some of the 18th century legislation or the 19th century Metropolitan Acts, uh, that is how we used to regulate the built environment. And you just knew, as long as you follow the rules, off you go, you can build. And that is not the case today. High planning risk is a barrier to entry, and that needs to come down. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Nicholas. And last but not least, Robert Coville, Director, Centre for Policy Studies. Robert. Thank you. So um, this conference is called Going for Growth. And the reason we've chosen to include housing in, is, in it is because housing is vital for growth. <laughs> One of the big problems in the British economy is that we have a colossal mismatch between where people can live and where people can work. The most, you know, it is virtually impossible to afford a home in most of the most productive and high value parts of the economy, partly because we do things like surround Greater London with an area, you know, double the size of it, where you're not allowed to build any, any homes. Um, so I think um, one of the things that people have been talking about, um, about the, the SME uh, uh, entry out there. So we published a piece of work called Help to Build, arguing for support for the housing market in this in this crisis, which included arguing for a stamp duty cut, um, which we're very pleased to see has happened. Um, and one of the things we sort of pointed out there is that the the British housing market, house building market, has become built around recessions. So essentially every time you have a crunch, more and more small house builders go to the wall, the market becomes more and more concentrated. And the big house builders kind of structure their business in the expectation that every few years it's going to fall off a cliff and they can shut down and lay, lay people off and sort of and weather the storm. And the result is that we, we have these very, very sharp dips and then these enormously slow recoveries. You know, um, after the 2008 crisis, it took years and years for house building to get back to where it needs, where it should be. And this isn't just an economic crisis, this is a social crisis. As, as has been pointed out, there is a generation for whom owning a home is a distant dream. But it's not just about, about house building, and this is why I'm particularly glad that Mike is here with us today and that Lloyds are, are supporting this overall. I mean, one, home ownership and house building are sort of interrelated but distinctive um, issues. One of the things which has happened since the, great, since the Great Recession is that the number of first-time buyer mortgages being issued by the banks has fallen by approximately a million, and the number of properties owned by buy-to-let landlords has risen by approximately a million. You know, it, we, we've worked out in some of our papers that if we had not built a single extra home in the last decade, but had banned people from buying second, third and fourth homes, we would be in a better position in terms of home ownership. And this is not Mike's fault and Lloyd's fault. Um, you know, they and the other banks are doing all they can to deliver home ownership. But part of the problem is, um, for example, the Bank of England imposes a stress test, which says that, you know, you need to not, when you get a mortgage on a fixed rate for five years, you need to not only be able to pay the, the standard variable rates when you come off that mortgage, but then a cut about two or three extra percent at, at the end, uh, uh, you know, just in case the economy is in a sort of collapsed state. So we're in this, we've got this very, very weird position where if you can afford a mortgage, if you can get that deposit, home ownership has never been more affordable or like not in, not in living memory. 
but it, but getting that deposit, getting onto the ladder has become insanely difficult. And obviously house prices have played an enormous role in that. But over the last 10 years, it's the deposit hurdle and it's the it's deposit affordability, which has really helped to, to sort of um, to exacerbate the crisis. And um, so I, you know, I know Lloyds are engaged on this and I'm sort of really um, keen to hear, to hear Mike's solutions. I mean, one of the things we've suggested is, is long-term fixed rate mortgages, partly because they are exempt from the Bank of England uh, stress tests because they never, there's no any, never any stress involved. So suddenly you're, in, you're, you're lowering the threshold to, to affordability. Great, thank you. So why don't we just pick up on that, on that last point and keep going with that. Um, we, we've, at the moment, what we've seen is, is the rise in transactions, but it's been fueled by the haves, the people who are cash rich and equity rich. It's not really um, for first time buyers. There's very few of them in the market. The stamp duty holiday hasn't really benefited them. They, they were already exempt up to 300,000. And as Robert said, the number of products for those with uh, less than a 10% uh, uh, deposit has shrunk massively. We've got help to buy changing in April. It will go to be um, first time buyers only with regional caps. Is there more we can do to help first time buyers? What, what more should we be doing? Mike, do you want to start out? Yeah, I'd love to, because actually there's a, there's a few really important things that have been drawn out in so great introductory remarks as well. Um, what is probably surprising, but not very well known, is that if you look at the UK economy, broadly speaking, a third of the people, a third of the households live in a rented accommodation, broadly speaking, two thirds in owned. And the third is not fundamentally different to where it was in the 80s. It's just the mix of social housing and private landlords has changed. So the, the landlords who bought properties have actually bought properties that people are renting. They might choose not to, but that's what they are doing. But the two thirds that is owned is, is, is a remarkable fact. And it's the switch between people who own outright and people who own with a mortgage. And it's not, it's not widely understood at all, but actually the number own outright has now overtaken. A couple of years ago, the number who own with a mortgage happened in 2016, 2017. And, and the point there is the boom of the, particularly the Thatcher years, as it's followed its way through, many, many more people bought a property with a mortgage, but they've paid it off now. And we're not getting the same replenishment of the stock for the reasons that you've mentioned. It's difficult to afford a house. Um, people, people who bought houses in their early 20s are now, on average, buying in their early to mid 30s as their very first property. Not surprisingly, uh, the mix has changed. And, and you've got this stock issue of the haves, as you've described it, who typically can help their children. And then the real challenge of people who haven't got have parents who are then trying to wrestle with, how on earth do I buy my next home? Um, and affordability and deposits, totally, totally right. The, the stress rate that we operate today is 6.59% in Lloyds. That's not our choice. That's the requirement of, um, of, of the regulation we work to. So you might pay 25 or 3% on your mortgage, but you have to demonstrate you can afford, in our case, 6.59. Typically, that means you have to prove you can afford a mortgage for the average person about 50% more than it actually will cost you when you move in. That's quite a hurdle. Um, it's prudent. It's definitely prudent. It came in after the last crisis. Uh, and then the second aspect of this, which is all about the deposit. And um, undoubtedly, if you haven't got the right parents and you haven't had the right life experience to save up, that could be a huge block to people buying their first ever property. Anyone else want to chip in? Yeah, I, I will. Um, I mean, I'll just say slightly off topic, if I may, just for a couple of sentences in case we don't cover it. Um, um, this isn't just a crisis of uh, house building for, for, for sale and for private sector rent. This is a crisis of social, the provision of social housing too. Um, Rob's right, the importance of house building for economics. The re every single recession in the UK of the last hundred years, we've re the recovery from it has been associated with a significant uptick in the rate of house building. So a house building boom, not least in the 1930s, when our house building boom saved us from a lot of the ravages of the Great Recession. The only exception in the last hundred years is the recovery from the crisis since 2008, which has been the slowest, most drawn out, tepid, if you like, recovery in recorded history. That's not a, that's not a coincidence. And it may sound, sound strange from a, a Telegraph columnist, but in my book, Home Truths, while I set out to write a book that was a love letter to home ownership, I actually ended up writing a lot about social housing too. Um, I do think the state should be borrowing to build houses 
And if you use resource accounting, you can put those houses on the state's balance sheet and you can be fiscally neutral quite quickly. There's a lot of private sector money that wants to join with the state in getting a yield in a controlled sector, given that guilt rates are negative, in building more social housing. We have an overcrowding height crisis in this country. We have a huge uptick in the number of what are called concealed households, almost barely mentioned in the mainstream media. And I do think at least part of the solution is building more social housing, not least because I'd rather that, you know, we had a third of people in social housing in 79, as we've just, as Mike just alluded to, and it's now about 17%. I think it should be more like 20, 25%. And I'd much rather build social housing that vulnerable and low income households can live in rather than spending upwards of 25 billion quid a year on housing benefit much of which goes to private landlords to provide often not always but often substandard insecure housing for some of our most vulnerable people yes of course okay. first time so buyers we, is a we, big we, political oh, crisis yes, mm. but the government also yeah. needs to realize that social housing is also a big social and political crisis Bob, you wanted to come in. Yeah, look, I mean, I don't, I don't look. When it, there's a, I mean, there's so many points raised. I'm not quite sure which ones we're going on, and I also will try to make my contribution pithy. Um, he, he was talking about, uh, Liam was talking uh, about the power of developers and their political influence. I'm uncomfortable with it. They've given us 11 million pounds in the last year, um, a, a significant, a large proportion of the 990,000 permissions outstanding are, are from the building cartels, aka the land speculators, what used to be called building companies, when they actually were building houses and not just speculating on land. So we need to put them under much greater pressure. I completely agree about, about building council houses. Again, I'll give you an example from the Isle of Wight. Last year, shockingly, we built zero affordable homes. We have 4,000 outstanding permissions, unfortunately, very often in the wrong places. Our problem is on the island, because we have a developer-led economy in house building, house builders want to come to places like the Isle of Wight and they want to build pretty generic, pretty depressing, low density, greenfield estates that damage our tourism economy and mean that we basically are building for people to retire to the island. Meanwhile, we are exporting young people because it's not just about building houses. It's about where you build them and what sort of houses. On the Isle of Wight, we need one and two bedroom properties for young islanders and sometimes old islanders downsizing in existing communities, sensitively built in the recognized island style. We have that brownfield land. However, it's very difficult for the council, which is small and struggling, to get access to government funds because we don't have a housing revenue account. So we could pump prime our house building, much lower numbers than are suggested. At the moment, our house building target is 600. We have, because we're an island, a difficult concept for ministers, but I'm working on it. Because we're an island, we have a building industry that can build steadily about 250 homes a year. We have a, a target of 600. A new target is about 1,100. The government might as well be telling us to organize a moon landing program for all our likelihood of achieving our targets. <laughs> or it could work with us sensibly to look after our folks on the island. And the reason why people like me are irate about this is not just because we're trying to be NIMBYs, although in my view, NIMBYs are local patriots, but because Dagenham and Dart Dartmoor and the Isle of Wight and other places all have the same problem, that the developers built the wrong, are building the wrong houses in the wrong numbers in the wrong places. One other final point, because this is not just about policy wonkland, it's about local democracy. As Scruton said, it's about culture. It's about appreciating the beautiful and uniqueness of rurality, suburban and city, and actually developing them all rather than suburbanizing the countryside, urbanizing um, suburbs and stripping out and donutting cities. Manchester, population declined since 1960, 22%. Liverpool, population declined since 1960, 35%. Uh, Newcastle, population declined since 1960, 15%. Isle of Wight, population increase since 1960, 30%. So my, my message to ministers is stop trying to build in the shires, stop trying to build in the suburbs, and actually focus on the levelling up agenda and get one or two bedroom properties, pump priming it 
in our cities where young people, COVID apart, where young people want to live. And we'll do our bit in places like the island and many other really beautiful and special parts of the world, of, of the UK, to look after our, our folks and build a little bit extra as well. But that is the answer, not policy wonkdom that floods green fields with the wrong type of housing in the wrong places. So I'm going to bring in a, um, a question from the audience early, because it's, it's relevant to what Bob's just said. It's, does the government need to examine the case for deregulating minimum space requirements to lower rent stroke house prices? Plenty of young professionals wouldn't mind sacrificing space to live in centre of town, zone one, for instance. Nicholas, what, what do you think to that? I think there are two, so thank you, I think there are two parts to that. Um, I think there should be uh, minimum space standards because when you've got, as we've all, I think, discussed and agreed, an overhang of undersupplied houses in much of the country, the the, the sad truth is that you know, it isn't just the people choosing to live in tiny flats in the city centre who end up living in tiny flats. It's people being uh, crammed into, you know, and I've been to some of them, you know, revolting flats in poorly designed, horrific places who are not choosing that. So the reality today is that whatever the economic theory would say, if there was an ample supply of housing, that isn't what's happening. So you know, as someone who's instinctively quite free market, I think there is a need to hold some minimum space standards. There's a more complicated issue about enforcement and overcrowding, like how many people get put into a home. That's a more complex issue to solve. Um, but that said, um, I think there's a very clear case to be made um, that in city centres, uh, you should be able to have, and actually London has moved in this direction with slightly changed standards a few years ago, what you might call micro homes. So, you know, there the clearly is a demand for living very close to the centre of very prosperous cities, and that should be possible. But I wouldn't extend that type of micro home out into the, you know, the, the zone threes, the fives, the suburbs and, and out beyond that. Um, if I just may decide one thing, I think if the white paper is to stick and to work, it, the, the government does need to deliver on very clear standards, both in local plans and in building regs. And that's the flip side. And I would urge them uh, to require minimum home standards in the in, in office and retail to resi conversion, because I think it makes it much more justifiable uh, that that's something, something permissible of right. Can I just come in very quickly on what Nicholas just said to support it? And I'll be super brief. He is exactly right. Because building companies, the builders want big fields for bog standard developments. But if we can change the system to make it economically viable to develop really small scale developments, not garden grabbing, but small scale developments, you will find those spaces in towns in places like the Isle of Wight and Schenken and Sandown and Freshwater, but across Britain. But they're not the places that the big boys, the big developers are interested in. So if we can get those micro developments, very often with those small scale modulus type, modulus type homes that Nicholas was talking about, and I suspect that name will be in favor of, that is the way ahead to create lots of housing in, in sort of high quality, dense, pop, high density populations and population areas. And let's remember, the highest density population in Europe is in Kensington. And I don't hear that many people complaining about living there. So we just need to get to, if we do high quality, densely in cities, it keeps everyone happy and places like the island and other bits of rural and suburban England can look after their own and keep those cultures and those identities whilst at the same time fitting into a wider national agenda. And my worry is that this one size fits all, computer says no attitude, is really beginning to dominate government thinking on this. Thank you. Carol, maybe just to add a couple of points, because um, the infill that you just heard talked about by Bob is, is, is spot on. And that, of course, is the is meat and drink to the smaller builders who have been squeezed out since 2008. Uh, more than 80% of the ones of the smaller builders disappeared in the last recession and never come back. Um, on, on space, I think one point that is very important, um, there are quite a, about 10% of currently declared new, new properties are actually conversions of, of offices. Um, there's a wide range of quality in that. And the, the worst end of that, with there's no natural light, there's sometimes not even any windows, um, uh, actually at its worst is also associated with the, with the very small properties and typically we wouldn't find them to be mortgageable we wouldn't we couldn't lend on them because we couldn't resell them and as a result they, they fundamentally fail in the purpose of, 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 of um, providing somewhere to live for people because actually you can't buy without a mortgage you can't get a mortgage you therefore you can't buy so the end up is spiraling down no, but Nick that there's a, such a simple solution for that and again if I may quote a local example because it's something I know about because our council is doing really great work doing work from home, we could potentially 
hive off a part of our 1960s somewhat depressing council building and use that in a brownfield site to generate lots of good quality homes and as long as there's a decent building standard to make sure that we build ethically uh, and in a humane way we could start getting those one and two bedroom pump priming our own towns and cities uh, towns on the island to be doing that and that is a much better way forward but the problem is it's slightly more complicated than allowing a developer to land bank yet another low density greenfield development site so, yeah so one, of the, one of the issues here is which ties into the sort of the growth point is the um is is community centers town and town town centers i mean which have been really even before the the crisis were completely were under the cosh so I'm, I'm completely with nick on the the need to um and dan with mike on the need to um accelerate change of use i mean there were, there were some statutory instruments which came in alongside the white paper which are which are meant to do that the, the, the fact is you know um you know, Town centres are basically only going to survive if they are, in many areas, sort of smaller, denser, and have have, have people living on them. Um, this doesn't just apply to first-time buyers, I mean, uh, who, um, but also to retirement housing. Um, one of the sort of um, problems that we look, Britain has, I think, you know, a ridiculously low multiple of retirement housing compared to other other countries. Partly because it's council under the current funding system for social care, councils see approving permissions for old people as as essentially a cost on, a drain on their resources but i mean c but coming back to the young people point you know, it, it's an it's an uncomfortable truth no matter how much we build we're not going to be able to change affordability unless we apt, unless we kind of drive bob insane with by you know and I, I think i think bob is kind of wrong on on quantity but you know we would need to build in staggering quantities um in order to actually um I, you know, to actually really really hit affordability so there is clearly a role for um, the kind of ideas Mike was talking about, about you know, getting people to use, you know, enabling people to use pension savings and stuff, you know, it's it's a bit it's a bit weird that we are telling people you need to, you know you need to save to your to your sixties, but you're never not going to be able to afford a house, you know, which kind of leads to this situation where you know how you know we're going to be paying housing benefits to people throughout their lives. It's a bad deal for them. It's a bad deal, bad deal for the country. I think shared ownership is another thing to look at. I mean, especially as we come to the end of help to buy. Um, it's you know it's got the worst name ever because I think whenever anyone hears shared ownership they think about they think it's just them living in a house with lots of other people, but actually the basic idea of um, that you know that you 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 get a bit you 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 buy as much of it, if you can't afford a, a full property you buy as much of that property as you can afford and then with every rental payment uh, you you uh, you increase your every mortgage payment you increase your your stake a little a little bit and a little bit until you end the whole thing I think that's you know. That's a really worthwhile exploring, not least because you know what the what's the alternative given that we can't you know unless we're just going to give people give people homes um, you know there's that's the only, that's kind of one of the only routes to ownership at a time when the the, the deposit cliff is so is so high. I'm just going to um, quickly go back to Nicholas because he has to leave at twelve fifteen. Um, so Nicholas, have you got I've got a few more words you want to say before you go? Thank you. And I'm sorry, everyone, that I have to leave. It's a, a prior commitment I can't get out of. Just to respond actually to what. Bob was saying, which I think is very important and actually touched on his opening remarks. Um, you know, there, there is a separate issue which has sort of haunted this conversation, which is the regional imbalances in the UK. Um, those, by the way, are nothing new. There was a brief period of about 200 years, you know, Industrial Revolution, when the north of this country became very important economically. But if you go back and look at regional you know, economic splits, literally in the Middle Ages or Anglo-Saxon England, this country has always been very uh, you know, d dominated by London in terms of local economic size, far more so than most countries. Um, how we fix that so that all the demand isn't where it currently is, is an incredibly vicious problem. Um, the pop I mean, Bob was quoting figures on the population of Liverpool and Manchester. It's, it's actually even worse than he says. If you compare the population of Liverpool in the 1930s to today, I think, I think the figure I have in my head, I won't absolutely swear by this, is that it's at 45% of the population it was. Mm. Um, we, we're doing, we, we create streets organisation around, we're currently working in a range of northern towns. Um, though some of them are lovely, uh, as a place to aspire to be and to set up a company or to work or to live or to uh, raise your family, Many of the town centres in less prosperous parts of the country, disproportionately but not entirely in the north, are no longer fulfilling the function that a town should fulfil as a place where we choose to and wish to come together to live our social lives, you know, to march, to, 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 to be humans. And, but Nicholas, and, th that is actually the critical point of this government, and thank you for raising that point, 
That is the leveling up agenda in a nutshell. Well, I mean, I was, you've taken the words options. out of my mouth. Sorry. Oh, you, okay, come, I'll go back to you. Well, no, I, was, I was about to say that. And I think, yeah, you know, I'm afraid I now do, do know to leave and apologise for that. But I think solving that is the, is the other side of the coin to meeting the housing challenge. But, but just to say, it isn't just about housing. And it isn't just about big shiny infrastructure. It's actually about how we rediscover the desire to live in some of these places, which is a, you know, it doesn't actually always involve huge numbers, but does involve, I think, a new way about how we think about our towns and places. And certainly Roger Scruton and I work absolutely as, as one on that. And with that, I'm afraid I, I have to leave. Thank you. Thank you, I, thank you very uh, much, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. May I follow? Um, or do you want Liam to come in? Um, Liam, I, am yes. I, am, I am nervous about getting rid of minimum space requirements. It seems like a council of despair. Um, you know, less than, little more than 1% of this country is covered with housing. The Green Belt covers 13% of this country, more than twice what it did by acreage in 1979. It's really not being concreted over. Though I do totally understand where a lot of MPs are coming from, Tory and, 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 and Labour and all the colours of the rainbow. Because these planning proposals, you take, you know, they, they lead to a lot less local democracy rather than more. And we can come to that. If you want SMEs to build more, as well as taking action, um, antitrust measures, which I think are unavoidable for any government that's serious about this at the top end of the market, you need to help SMEs get access to land. Um, the government owns between four and six percent of the land in this country depending on how you measure it beyond the national parks and the treasury dogma needs to be dropped they need to be getting that land into the hands of builders prioritizing uh, small builders uh, i don't agree i have a rare disagreement with rob colville i do think i don't think you need to build like crazy to have an impact on affordability uh, at all there are some figures in my book home truths where i compare britain and france over the last 40 years. And I know Neil O'Brien's done some similar calculations uh, where real house prices in France have remained much more affordable across the spectrum. And they've built twice as many houses as we have. Uh, and that's, and have, have actually had a higher rate of immigration than we have. Um, I think if you really want to get hold of this agenda and make changes that will last the course for a generation, you do need to revisit the 1961 Land Compensation Act, which of course gives almost all planning gain to landowners and, and developers. Um, you do need to share that planning uplift as happens in many parts of America, Singapore, Australia, Germany, the Netherlands. This is not a socialist idea. This is making capitalism work for more people. And if you share that planning gain, I've suggested 50-50 in my book, when he was then Chancellor, Sajid Javid agreed with me on the record. Tony, the late Tony Pidgeley, probably the most successful individual house builder this country's produced since the Second World War, agreed with me on the record. This is not a mad idea. And I know an awful lot of parliamentarians agree with me and select committees in both the Commons and the Lords. If you reverse that 1961 Land Compensation Act, which Keith Joseph himself recommended when he was housing minister, big connections to the CPS, you will take the speculative heat out of the land market. There'll be more access to land for smaller builders. Crucially, you will have funding at the local authority level that can build the schools, the hospitals, the bypasses, even give a council tax holiday in return for development. By doing that, you will revolutionize the fraught local politics of planning and a lot of people's general aim to want more housing. So, you know, Thomas and Rebecca can get on the housing ladder because this is, of course, is a problem for white collar families uh, these days, as well as blue collar families, uh, then you, you, will, you will be able to, to not force development onto local communities. You will have much, much higher proportions of local communities who actually want that development because the new houses bring with them the infrastructure, the doctor's surgeries uh, that, that compensate for the downsides. And you'll find in many cases, majority support for building. Okay, can we just move now to some of the questions that we've got coming in, some that are relevant to what Liam was just saying. Uh, we've got one here that says, why can't we have a lose it or use it um, philosophy on land? Another, why not tax land with permission that's not being built on? Okay. What um, do we think just of on that the use it or lose it, I completely agree. 
I think if a developer hasn't started a development after six months, after 12 months, they pay a 2% fine on the, the 2% of value of, of plot. And if they don't finish it within, let's say, 18 months within an agreed time, they pay a, a 3% or 2% uh, tax on the value of the plot. So you actually make it incredibly painful. And you actually treat it as a source of revenue for the treasury. Because once a permission has been given, if it happens, if it doesn't happen, the developer starts to lose a lot of money on it and does so within a period of two years. Again, I mean, I, I think the developers and the land speculators, aka the building companies, have had it way too easy for way too long and they're actually part of the problem for the blockage. So I completely agree. And it's yeah. just totally bizarre why we don't have it and why nobody's gripped them. Um, I think they have too much political influence, to put it bluntly. Um, just want to go back, if I may, to something Nicholas has said in this. Look, the, leveling up, the, 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 the crux of the matter politically for the next five years is the levelling up agenda in relation to northern cities and towns and housing and infrastructure development. And the success of this government is going to be on how it does all that. And it, you actually have to make people want to live in towns because there's two options now. You either donut a town, so you develop around it and you write off the town, which is the, 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 the most free market American model. I love lots of things about America, but not always the donutting of cities and towns. You donut a town, or you ruin it and you build around it, um, or you reinvest in that town or that city. And that's what we've absolutely got to do. And leveling up for me means reinvesting in towns and cities. And not only in Sheffield, not only in Manchester and Newcastle, but in Sandown, in Newport, in Freshwater, in my little local, beautiful little towns here that have got brownfield sites as well. So that's got to be the focus. And that takes an extra bit of time and money rather than an easy and lazy approach of allowing developers to buy greenfield sites, which in my patch will ruin, will damage my tourism economy and just means that we become uh, a place which exports young people and, and, and imports retirees. Okay. I'm, going to go on to an, I'm going to go on to another question. We need to get through some of, some of the questions. Uh, what role can the private rented sector play in improving the economy? With the economic consequences of the pandemic yet to play out, surely people will become reliant on it, on it again, as happened in 2008. Like you, need a vibrant, you need a vibrant, I'll give you one sentence, you need a vibrant mixed market and high quality private rental is an important part of that because there's always going to be a demand for it. So you need that as part of a mixed approach. But actually the, the real failing here is driving enough social housing uh, and, and, you know, rent to buy and right to buy, but also rent to buy schemes to get young people affordable housing, especially in cities and towns. Yeah, and we need to recognise, Carol, how, how important the private rental sector now is. Uh, as Mike, Mike Jones alluded, it, we've gone from about 10% to 20% of the population in the private rental sector uh, over the last couple of decades. Uh, I think what's really important to say is, you know, while some of my solutions may say, may feel a little bit interventionist for some Conservatives, you know, the danger here is um, that unless we um, grab hold of this problem and make the housing market work better by freeing it up, by injecting some genuine competition, as Adam Smith taught us, then you are going to have some really nasty, completely counterproductive pr measures proposed by the other side that will then become law. And I'm, you know, I grew up in the salubrious London of, of, of rent controls and setting tenants. You know, it just simply doesn't work. Of course, we need a vibrant uh, rented sector. We should also note that the situation is now so acute that whereas in 1991, um, the average 20, uh, uh, when a woman reached 28, which for them was the average age of first child, uh, uh, only one in 10 women lived in the private rented sector. The average uh, for 28 year old women now, uh, you got 45% of them living in the private rented sector. Uh, the point is the insecurity of, uh, 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 of, of their lives and not being able to build a home is now affecting our demography and to link back the housing industry and the housing market to growth. You know, demography is destiny. Um, we are, we are, we are, our, our, our population is now being affected. The future growth of our, of our indigenous population, if you like, from people living here by a lack uh, of, of housing overcrowding and an inability of many young adults as they move into the next stage of their lives uh, to buy a home, to settle down uh, and actually form a family. Liam, I, th I think, can I just say, I think a lot of people... I, 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 we're, 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 oh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, just quickly, on, on rent, mortgage lenders are a force for good because they are another mechanism for policing the quality of a property to make it mortgageable. In addition to all the things the local authorities do, and it forces the standards to be raised. And indeed, sustainability and um, the insulation on property and so on is now part of that in the way that the process works. Can, can I go to first-time buyers? Because I'm, I'm just worried. We're talking lots about building properties, but someone's got to buy them. And the point yes, about- Yes, we've got lots of mortgage questions, actually, Mike. Do you want me to start? <laughs> I'm keen to get some of the questions out. So uh, we've got uh, a few here. We've got, um, on mortgages, buying off plan exposes customers to risk the mortgage offer is withdrawn if they lose their job, which would lose their life savings. This stops pre-sales and slows build rates. Uh, well, look, that's, that's a real self-evident risk, isn't it? M much of plan work is bought by people who've got the cash and don't need the borrowing because that protects them against exactly what you've described. Um, and the mortgage rates change. You know, you'll get your guarantee and typically it's much longer for a new build, i.e. Of, of plan, but it's still typically only a year. Um, and that might not be enough to complete the bill. So there are risks associated with that, yes, if you need a mortgage. And another one is, what does Lloyds think about the possibility of 25-year fixed rates to avoid the interest rate stress test? Um, it's a double-edged sword. Um, remember, the risk of your mortgage determines the price of your mortgage. So at the very outset, a two-year deal, fine current rates, but two years later, your mortgage, you'll have repaid off on average about 5%. You're typically in a lower risk category, you're going to get a lower rate. So the catch with 25 years is you're locking in typically for a higher rate for a longer period of time. That's a 25, that's a 10 year problem. But if you wanted the certainty, well, we have had 25 year mortgages actually in our history back in the 90s, they were quite, they were available, but not commonly taken up. Uh, five to 10 is much more common and appropriate because the flexibility you get, of course, um, is much higher as well in the situation because like, people's circumstances change. I think we stretch from a typical two to a typical five year in the market. That's the norm these days. That in itself is good progress. That's happened in the last three years. I mean, okay. the, the objection I'd make on that um, is just that, you know, back in the 90s, we didn't have um, guilt rates and bond rates at their lowest in yeah. recorded history. So I, I think what I think, I mean, we need to find a way of doing um, and, you know, for our money, it's long term fixed rate mortgages, but I think there are other is is effectively trying to democratize those low interest rates. At the moment, they are only accessible to the people who already have assets, especially the people who already have property assets, which is one of the reasons why um, buy to let increased so much after 2008, because they were the only people who, you know, they were only people who had money to, 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 to buy their homes. I mean, you know, it shouldn't, it, we should be able to find a way, and I'd, I'd be fascinated by Mike's thoughts on this and, and everyone else's, to, you know, to, 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 help, to help people onto the property ladder, you know, even, even if it's step by step, to help them get access to this, um, you know, to, 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 to the, 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 great, the most affordable period of home ownership, if you have the assets that we've ever had. And I mean, one of the problems with help to buy is effectively it was very useful, but only for a, for a tranche of people, for the sort of, for quite a lot of people who are probably already going to buy, and then the people just below that. It still left this, this large sector of the, of the economy um, um, untouched. And actually one of the really interesting things about social housing, which has come up a few times, is the, the uh, as our research has shown that the, you know, the, the, the queue for social housing is not dependent on the stock of social housing. It's dependent on the affordability of home yeah. You know, people people want home ownership, and that's you know, and social so, social housing kind of gets the gets the list of people who can't who can't afford home ownership. But if everyone if people ever have the choice between owning their own place and renting, either privately or from the state, they will universally choose to be homeowners. So we just jump in there with another question, which is relevant. What happens when help to buy ends? Is there any hope for young people who want to get on the housing ladder but can't raise a large deposit? I, I think just here, one of the things that I think we need to do, I, I think right to buy back in the age of Mrs. Thatcher was great. The problem is it drained housing stock. So for many places that don't have very large scale housing stock, i.e. for places outside cities, what we need is not necessarily the right to buy the house you're in, but rent to buy schemes. So you help young people build up a deposit in the, whilst living in a, in a subsidized house if need be, or flat, so they can then go out into the marketplace after five years of saving up and actually have that deposit, have that cash to help them purchase somewhere. And certainly for smaller authorities like the Isle of Wight that very bravely wants to set up its own building company, its own um, house construction company to build housing. So we have our own housing stock. 
we need a rent to buy scheme that can accompany that to help young people, not only of this generation, but future generations as well. So as well as being more creative about reviving our cities and the leveling up agenda, we need to develop to make sure that we prioritize those good schemes that keep housing in, in, in public domain or housing stock in housing associations, but also help young people get onto the housing ladder. Rob, Rob's, actually, Rob, Rob's actually absolutely right about democratizing finance. I'm just looking up some spreadsheets here. If you've got a 95% uh, LTV, uh, you're paying almost 4% from most of the mainstream lenders. And that's, you know... That's if you can get one. That's if you, <laughs> and it's also rationed not just by price, but also by uh, uh, access. But we've got to make sure also that the tail isn't wagging the dog here. Yes, we want our young people to be able to borrow, but do we really want them to be able to borrow you know, right up to the point where the average house price these days is eight times average earnings, which is you know, double the long-term average. And of course, in many cities, it's over 10 times. In London, and the, in, in, in London it's 14 times uh, average earnings. So you do have to address the chronic shortage uh, of homes. And I don't think Help to Buy does that. The big house builders have made massive margins out of Help to Buy. That's when Theresa May, when she announced more of it at the 2017 mm. conference, the big four house builders within five seconds had, had added over one billion pounds to their share price. I, well, like I think the government prices. has put the government's put something like 16 billion into help to buy so far. Absolutely. And it has not led to an increase in house building. OK, the big house builders are building fewer than they were before 2008. So it's great for developer contributions to the Conservative Party that that Bob has talked about so elegantly and with such courage, I should say, um, but it isn't going to be a, a decent long-term solution. I think, again, the state should be, you know, making its own land available for small builders, for SMEs, so they can ha build houses, the ultimate price of which, given that these days 70% of the price of the average new build home is the land, which shows how uh, it was less than 5% in the 50s when housing was more affordable. So the houses that are ultimately produced by SMEs can be produced at a profit for the SME builder, get them going, but at a price because the land is cheaper that first time buyers can afford. This sounds like quite a, a heavy handed intervention, but we're at the point now, I would say, Carol, where unless we do something quite radical, this very, very serious problem and all the social, economic and political fallout from it will not solve itself. Right. We need to start winding up now. We've got um, just a few minutes left. I'm going to ask each of the panellists, the four that are left, to just very briefly uh, sort of wrap up with answering the original question. What is the role of housing in the recovery? And we'll start with you, Bob. Rolling of by the way, whenever um, I get accused of being courageous, I get very worried about what I've just said. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but it needs to be said the builders are not in a yes minister here. sense <laughs> yeah, no absolutely in a yes minister sense although i will never be a minister because obviously i'm too <laughs> courageous as you say um i actually get worried about the building company because i think right now they're part of the problem and i think it's shocking the way they increase their share price uh and i think it's probably massive misuse of public money much better places to use it uh, housing has an important role but it's got to be the right housing in the right places all our, all our projection of population increase on the island, for example, is age 65 and above. How that helps drive economic growth rather than just creating adult social care dependency, I'm unclear on. It's also going to ruin our tourism economy, damage our quality of life. So if we're not going to have an entirely free market in this country, which realistically we're never going to have, we need sensible controls and we need to focus on the levelling up agenda, not concreting out the South East. The government's new method targets are completely wrong because they lower the demand for northern cities and towns to build housing and shove too much of that housing down to the southeast. So okay, we, need, we need to I want to I want the leveling up agenda to work, but at okay, the moment great. it doesn't seem to be. Great. We need to move on. Um, we keep it brief, please. Uh, Liam. Well, thanks to Rob and CPS for asking me. Uh, you thought you were going to get a minister. Um, uh, and, I, and I've stepped in uh, maybe with a, a bit of a different message. The link between house building and growth is unanswerably very, very strong historically and in common sense terms, unless we get building not just with conversions and permitted development rights, but sustainably increasing the rate 
of house building, both social house building and incentivizing the private sector, changing the financial incentives of the big house builders with fines for late building, then we won't get that growth. The government's planning proposals are okay as far as they go. Um, uh, we do need more zonal development in some places, but they aren't really getting at the nub of the problem. And the nub of the problem is this, a planning permission is not uh, an opportunity for a big developer to bolster their balance sheet for years and control local markets and build as and when they want to. A planning permission is a contract given by the state to a builder, a contract between the builder and the local community to build and build within a reasonable amount of time. No amount of best endeavors or undertakings are gonna change that, are gonna make big house builders do that when it's to their financial advantage to practice contrived scarcity. You need to tweak the financial incentives so chief executives and shareholders know the most logical financial thing to do is to build. Okay, Mike. Uh, thank you. People need to be able to buy the houses that we're building, um, help to buy other interventions, shared ownership and so on, all help. The new version of help to buy targeted on first time buyers and at the entry level to the market, not the higher level, is so much better use of government money than, than the current scheme. I applaud that entirely. The guarantee scheme is a way of helping people with their deposits. It doesn't exist now, but it did before. It actually worked very, very well at the time. It was withdrawn in 2016. But, but you know, we, we require our people to save from a very early age for their pension, and they then have to salt it away for the next 40 odd years. Actually, the best use they can make of their money is in buying a property, in the sense that by the time they retire, they don't have to pay rent, if they paid off their mortgage, that's hugely important. And actually, can we reuse those savings, either in cash or even better, actually, as a guarantee, so leave the money in the pension fund, but just to guarantee the right as a quasi deposit into that first property. There's things we could do which make a real difference to turn the supply of property into properties that actually people want to buy and can actually afford. Great. And final word, Robert. Well, yeah, I have to um, interview Sajid after this, so I, <laughs> I need to, to, to finish on time. Um, I'm going to, um, so I'm, Mike is absolutely right. I'm really uh, tempted by this the, the idea of pension savings. You know, homes are not just. Uh, you know, a great thing for people to have. They are what you give you a sort of secure base. You know, you know, people will are you know they give you your security. They give you a sense of community. They're just they're just wonderful things to have. Um, and also, just while we were, as Liam pointed out, you know, recoveries tend to be driven by construction. And there's a reason that pump priming uh, and Kim Keynesian stimulus tends to focus on you know digging things out of the earth because it's a it's a really good thing to do. Um, you know, I, I think the stats are that every job, every house built, you know, creates or supports three jobs. So um, yeah, I think um, lots more building and lots more ways to make them affordable to young people would be pretty good. Great, thank you. Thank you to all our panelists. I think we have concluded that housing definitely does have a role in recovery, but it's not straightforward and there are gonna to have to be some pretty dramatic changes if we're gonna get the housing that we want and need in the places that we want to need it. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. We're not live anymore. Just to say massive thank you for Great. joining thank us today. You. Thank you so very much. Lovely. Thank Bye. you. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.